see all of you. I'm really pleased to welcome you to the Meet the Instruments class. Again, today for our grand finale, focusing on the fascinating instruments and the percussion family. And I was thinking about this today. Truth be known, can you hear me all right? Can you hear okay? Yes. I'm going to mute Dr. Broadway just while you're talking. Maybe that's yeah. it. <clears throat> I'm, I'm getting some echo, Don. Okay. Echo. Do you have external speakers? Yeah, I'll get a little closer. How's that? That's better. Right. In thinking about today's program, I uh, can, it, uh, came to me that probably everyone here has one, wanted at one time or another to be a percussionist. Maybe it started when we were in rhythm band in elementary school, or when we were in high school and we saw how much fun all the people in the drum line were having in the marching band. When our fantasies took hold, we imagined ourselves being a drummer in a rock band. So I think this should be special fun for all of you. Our presenter today is Dr. Kenneth Broadway, who holds Bachelor of Music, Master of Music, and Doctor of Musical Arts degrees from the University of Georgia. In 1997, we were very fortunate and indeed to attract Ken to UF to serve as Director of Percussion Studies in our School of Music. Before coming to Florida, Ken had served in similar capacities at the University of South Dakota and Augusta State University, also in South Dakota. Dr. Broadway has performed at Carnegie Hall, the Palato Festival, and with symphony orchestras in Florida, Georgia, Iowa, South Carolina, and South Dakota. He's also traveled to Spain and Kenya as part of the World Music Mission, which is a multinational network musicians, writers, worship leaders, engineers, and ethnomusicologists. In addition, as a performer, composer, and presenter, Dr. Broadway has been invited to appear at various professional music conferences and symposia throughout North America, Europe, and Australia. And he has served as an officer in numerous professional music organizations, including being president of the National Association of college wind and percussion instructors, which has a wonderful acronym called NACWAPI. I love that. In summary, under his leadership, U.S. percussion program has flourished and gained international recognition for its excellence. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Kenneth Broadway. Thank you very much. And um, wow, it's um, I was thinking about this as I was sitting here getting ready to start speaking that, yeah, I remember uh, Don McLaughlin, I spoke to him when I interviewed for this position back in 1997, and how amazingly blessed I feel to be here for the past 23, now going on 24 years. It has just been amazing to see the growth of the program, and I just am, um, every day my students often ask me, you know, what, what do you love most about your job? And I love what music does for the human condition. I love what it does for my students. During this time of pandemic where my students couldn't be for a while to, with me, I felt this sense of separation. And I am so honored to speak to you. I'm so glad that you are able to reach out and to get some communication. And even though in some ways the pandemic has separated us, in other ways, especially for me as a percussionist, I have a lot of equipment and I couldn't bring all that to every single one of you. This is a good way to let you kind of come into my little playroom, if you will, my home. By the way, I am at the university right now. I do have permission to take off my mask. I'm in an enclosed space by myself right now, and there'll be a point for the air to clear when I get done. So just to let you know about that, I always like to make that caveat when I speak from this space. But normally during my teaching, I wear a mask all the time for the safety of myself and the students. So first of all, you know, I don't really know exactly the best way to handle this other than to kind of teach you a little bit about percussion. I don't want this to be like a class, but also as an educator, I want to make sure that um, I do feel like I've given you some knowledge about percussion. So I am going to, I do have a very short, I promise, very short PowerPoint. So I'm going to share that with you now as I bring that up. And I'm the first to admit, I am not a huge technology person so this won't be maybe nearly as many bells and whistles as you might have seen from some of my other ones and I will try to get this to share in a moment here we go 
Finally, there we go. So the percussion instruments. Hope you can see that okay. A thumbs up from somebody. That's if it's great. There. Perfect. All right. So first of all, we have a lot of uh, big words we use for things that we hit. Percussion instruments have been around cultures, you know, prehistoric times. As long as there's been music, there have been percussion instruments. Sometimes it's been body percussion. Sometimes it's been hitting logs, membranes, and things like that. So I just want to give you a, a little bit of a background of this. So early percussion instruments. Um, probably the earliest instrument we have is some kind of drum. A friend of mine who is a historian who speaks about drumming talks a lot about membranophones. Oops, I got idiophones here. So I'm going to actually go backwards. Now, idiophones are basically anything you strike that makes sound. You see some rocks there. An idiophone could be two rocks struck together. It could be a log drum struck with a stick. But essentially, an idiophone is anything you strike that uh, makes the noise itself. When I clap my hands, essentially, that's an idiophone. If I strike a table that's right next to me, that's an idiophone as well. So the probably the most common percussion instrument we think of is a membranophone. This is a typical drum that has something stretched over it. For example, I have with me right now a djembe, which is a drum from Africa, be struck with the hands. But as my friend, who is an ethnomusicologist, would say, he says, essentially, whatever head is stretched across that drum is probably what the people ate for dinner the night before. So many times you'll have a sheepskin head or a calfskin head. I've even seen, I even have one drum that has a snakeskin head. And that drum is fairly large. That must have been a big, big snake on that. So membranophones are anything with that membrane stretched across. Idiophones are anything we strike together. Maybe like cymbals, if you think about that, finger cymbals. That'd be a great idiophone. Aerophones. I'm not going to bring any of those in here because they would be very shrill. We as percussionists often are the sound effects people in the orchestra. We blow whistles. We have slide whistles. We have police whistles. We have train whistles. Anything where that air produces the sound. And finally, in this modern era we're in, we have something called an electrophone, MIDI instruments. Now, we're very fortunate in this era we're in to have these instruments. MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And especially in these pandemic times, we've been making great use of these digital instruments to produce music over long distances. We normally could not do so. So those are the aphones, if you will. And I'm going to have a little bit of fun demonstrating those aphones for you in a few minutes. I want to make sure this is more interactive. But I want to play a couple of examples of some significant percussion music. I think it's important to know the history of these instruments and how they've worked their way into what we consider to be art music. So I'm going to switch my screen share here for a second and go to a different place. All right, so the earliest percussion ensemble pieces where we had percussion were written in places like South America and Cuba and places like that. So I want to play a little bit of what we consider to be our first percussion ensemble piece. Now, those of you who are historians, this may not be the piece you're thinking I'm going to play. It's a piece by Emmanuel Rodin called Rhythmica No. 5. I want you to give a listen to this piece. And I think I share my computer sound, so make sure you check your volume at this point. And Julie, you'll give you the heads up if it doesn't come through. Right now, we're still looking, we're still looking at the picture of the electrophones. Is that right? Oh. Okay. Did it switch yet? No, no. You might have to stop screen sharing and then go back. Thank you. I will do that real quick. So give me just a chance to do that. I guess it didn't let me do that seamlessly. I apologize. As I mentioned, I am not as good with technology as some. So I will share my screen again. Thank you for your patience with me, by the way. I broke them all in for you, Dr. Brown. All right. Can you see the screen now with YouTube? Yes. yes, yes Perfect. Yes. All right. We will take two.
But see, notice there are a lot of these instruments we spoke about a moment ago. We have idiophones, which would be things like the gluro. You can see somebody scratching at it. The claves you might have heard when you hear the bump, 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 bump. Then you see membranophones. You see bongos, timbales, timpani are actually a membranophone. You hear marimba, which is actually an idiophone as well. So these are the common instruments we'll often use in a percussion group. So this piece actually predates the one that is often called the first percussion ensemble piece. So I'm going to stop this year and I'll bring up a different one. The next piece I want to play for you is very different. It's called ionization. If you've ever had any music history classes, you've probably heard of this piece of a landmark piece by Edgar Varese. Now the rhythmica actually predates ionization, but ionization is considered the first percussion ensemble piece because it is considered to be a concert performance piece of art music. So let me bring that up now. Real quick change. And hopefully you can see ionization now. All right. Is the sound coming through okay, by the way? I don't hear anything yet. Okay. In general, did you hear on the last one? Yes. Yes. Good. All right. Excellent. Then it should be working. It should be the next one. So a very different type of piece, isn't it? You see some of the same instruments. You see maracas, you see some bongos, you see some drums, but they're used in a very different way by Varese than they were by Roldan. And I want to play one more example for you. This, again, is a landmark early piece that's going to be considerably different than the other two. It's a piece by Antil, and it is called Ballet Mechanique. Again, an older piece, but this was done for uh, incidental music for a ballet, and you're going to see some very interesting instruments. Player piano is one that you'll see in here. So this is one that a lot of people aren't even aware of, even percussionists. Thank you. 
before you get too dizzy, we'll stop it at that point. So uh, I'll tell you one thing. Um, sometimes my students ask me, what's your favorite kind of music? And I say, that's kind of like asking you who your favorite kid is. I could listen to that piece all the time, but I could also listen to rock and roll, and I could listen to jazz. The great thing about percussion, the world I live in, is that you see all these different things I've shown you today are just a small little piece of what I get to do, honestly, on a weekly basis. It's, I, I sometimes, and I shouldn't say this in front of Don McLaughlin because he may regret hiring me, but I can't believe they pay me to do this. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. And maybe some of you have a career like that. You think, gosh, I can't believe they pay me to do this. So that kind of gives you an idea of what percussion can be. It can be something that is struck together like cymbals it can be struck with a stick, like a membrane. It can be sirens. It can be um, electrophones. It can be whistles. All these different things are all percussion. The piano is a percussion instrument, technically speaking. The hammers strike the string. So with that in mind, now I want to kind of give you an idea, a little bit into my, call my playroom, if you will. So Julie, I don't know, can you make my video, kind of a spotlight video, a little bigger right now? I don't know if that's something you can do. So, no. Each, Each person, person can put you on speaker oh. too. Okay. I'm going to try this. I'm trying to spotlight it for everyone. I don't know if that made it big for everyone, but if you can make it larger, that would be ideal because you'd be able to see a little bit more from the, the big pane of what it looks like. So make sure you make this the big view or speaker view. And I tried to spotlight the video from everyone. So Julie, can you see that big right now? Yeah, because I have it on speaker view. Good. So if you want to make sure you switch it to speaker view if you haven't already, uh, please do so. So now I'm in my little world here. This is the percussion studio. And I don't think that Don ever got a chance to see this, but I can tell you that his hard work in the College of the Arts led to this actually happening. This is made by the Winger Corporation. It is actually the largest Winger module that exists in the world. It has been built specifically for this space to house the percussion instruments in a safe environment that is climate controlled and sound control. There are panels on the root, on the walls and ceiling that make sure that it protects our hearing and the floor is raised in a certain way to help capture the sound. It's not soundproof, but it certainly is sound protecting. So this is where I spend a lot of time with my students every week. So you can see I'm kind of surrounded by a bunch of instruments and I'm gonna kind of go through them kind of from the um, membranes first and then talk about the others. So bear with me because you make a little vertigo as I turn some things around. As I move my view. So I have here probably the most common membranophone in the band area. I'm going to step away from the mic and talk a little bit louder. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Okay, Julie, still hear me all right from here? Yes, okay, sir. This is, this is the snare drum, okay? It is a membrane. Originally, this was a military instrument, and it would have, um, been something used in an ensemble. So my microphone just turned off. I hope you can hear me. I think I got a microphone error. I can hear you. So I'm going to come over here and see if I unplug something by accident. I can hear you. Can you hear, you hear us? Happened there? I'm going to take just a sec. I apologize. I saw my microphone setting to move up and you don't. Uh... Dr. Broadway, can you hear me? All right. Can you still hear me? Yes. 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 Very good. I just wanted to switch that microphone because it would have been a little bit loud on the other one. Excellent. So the snare drum originally was a military instrument. It would have been carried. You've probably seen it in a marching band. It has a on the bottom of it some wires or cables. Originally it would have actually been, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it, it would have been the intestine of some animal like beef gut that would have been dried and stretched across there. And it gives it kind of a raspy sound. <laughs> You heard this when we were in ionization, the very first attack was the snare drum roll. We often think about the quintessential snare drum part as the beginning of the Star Spangled Banner. Where we play that roll and let it last forever and ever. So I'm gonna play a little excerpt for you on snare drum, give you an idea how this membrane sounds, how this membranophone sounds in music. This is actually a French piece by Jacques Delaclue. It's just a snare drum etude, it's a practice etude. I hope you enjoy it. And again, if you're listening on your mics, just make sure some of the things I do might be a little bit loud, and I want to make sure that I protect your hearing.
it gives you the way that the snare drum sounds. These are the kinds of things I do with my students to develop musicality. One thing we often say about percussion is certainly it is something we strike, we beat percussion, but certainly it should be a musical instrument that we use with nuance as well. So one of the challenges I have with my students is many of them come to me with a lot of experience playing the drums, but they haven't learned how to be a, a full musician and percussionist. There's an old joke we often say, and I always hate the joke, but I'll tell it anyway. What do you call someone who hangs around with musicians? A drummer. And that joke always hurts me just a little bit. Quite frankly, though, in my heart, even though I'm a percussionist in all ways, I'm still a drummer. Elementally, I still play the drums. I play drum set. I play hand drums. I do all sorts of things that I consider to be drumming. I want to play one more membrana phone for you, and that's the timpani or the kettle drums, probably the most common one in orchestras. I'm going to play a little excerpt for you. It's from the Holly Accords by Handel's Messiah, and it really is a beautiful example of how the timpani are used normally paired with brass, and I wish I had my colleague uh, Randy Lee here so we could play it together and we could show the way that it all connects and things like that, but this is a little excerpt from Holly of course. It'll probably sound a little muffled on your speakers, but I did not want to get the timpani too close to the microphone. you know that piece, I hope that you were able to hear it in your head when I played it. I always say that the joy of percussion is that in any really any music is when I'm playing music by myself, I, I think about all the things going on with me. I'm hearing the trumpets, I'm hearing the violin, I'm hearing the singers in the choir. I always feel like I've got a little orchestra in my head or a jazz band in my head or a rock band in my head going all the time. And it's a good thing. It's not a crazy thing. So these membrana phones, the snare drum and the timpani, are probably ones you hear a lot in the orchestra. And certainly you hear the snare drum a lot in many settings. I want to give you a couple of others that maybe are a little less common. Okay, one of these I mentioned to you before, it's called the djembe. Actually, have it. I'm going to turn my camera angle down away from my face and let you see the instrument. You see the djembe, which is a drum from Africa. It's common in most African cultures. Usually it's made from a hollowed out log. And you can see I have one in the room with me. It's actually a little more authentic with rope tuning back there, but the head unfortunately split in the dryness. It actually has a, a calfskin head on it. So I came in this morning and because we've had such a cold day and it's such a dry environment right now, that head split, so I can't play that one. So this is actually made out of a synthetic material that is like an animal skin and the, head, and the drum is made out of a, a fiberglass material. But this drum is very different. It's not struck with sticks. It is struck with the hands.
it's a little different. And how here, I want you to kind of give you a, a sense of this world of percussion we live in. That's still a membrana phone, certainly very different than a snare drum or a timpani. But I'm not thinking about an orchestra or band anymore. So I'm curious if, if any of you have ever seen this in its normal sense. You know, I, I know you can't unmute and yell it out. I wish this were a, a chance for you to actually be able to tell what you're seeing in your head. What I'm seeing in my head are dancers because the djembe in dance is so connected in African culture. I'm just seeing the swaying. I'm seeing the colorful outfits and things like that. So as I play this instrument, I'm not thinking about an orchestra. I'm not thinking about trumpets. I'm thinking about a community. I'm thinking about the way that this community is connected through music, through dance. The drum call is actually very connected to the language of Africa. So certain words you speak would sound like the rhythms you're playing. As a friend of mine once said, if he went to the center of his village, he was from Ghana, and played a certain rhythm, everybody would know to come out because there's going to be a party. If he played a different rhythm, people would know to come out because there was going to be a fight. If he played a different rhythm, people would know that they had to come out because their village was under attack. And this drum that is so elemental in these aspects of culture was so much a part of the African culture. It's one reason why when slaves were brought from Africa to the New World, to the Americas, the drums were not allowed because they knew people would be able to communicate with one another and they didn't want that, the colonial governments. So they took the drums away. But resourceful people who feel passionately about music find ways to make music. So the next instrument I want to show you is one that grew out of, if you will, this concept. I'm going to have to turn my stand. I'm starting to wrap my cords around. So I'm going to spin, spin the other way here. And now we're going to talk about this instrument right here. This is the steel drum, or this really the steel pan is the name from Trinidad. i turn it so you can see inside. So this instrument was made from a 55 gallon oil drum that was hammered down and shaped and tuned. It is a pitched instrument, so it, but it is an idiophone. We strike it. So we can play scales, we can play chords, we can do all sorts of things. But in Trinidad and Tobago, where the instrument originated, drums were outlawed. So people would turn anything they could into a drum, trash cans, uh, cookie tins, and things like that. And through trial and error, they started realizing as they beat these pans down and certain notes became shaped, they started having relative pitch. And resourceful people started tuning it very specifically to pitches that, like the piano, what we call Western tuning, if you will, 12 chromatic pitches. So then we had the steel drum grow out of that. So the steel pan is just, it's a, a joy of mine. I've been playing it now for most of my professional career. And it's become, you know, something that I do just all the time. It's often associated with calypso and soca music, but it's actually becoming a great art instrument, an art music instrument being written for by renowned composers. There are now concerti for steel pans and orchestras and things like that. So now you see my life, a little bit of a snapshot into some of it. I play snare drum in marching percussion. I play timpani in orchestras. I play the djembe with dance ensembles, and then I play the steel drum. Uh, with our steel band here at the university. We actually just started up our steel band again. We had to take a hiatus due to the COVID issue, but now we are going. Oh, cost of the steel pan, please. Thank you for putting something in the chat. I will try to keep track of that. This particular instrument is actually built in Trinidad. I went to Trinidad and got it and brought it back. So I was able to get it at a much cheaper rate than if you bought it in the United States. But if you had to buy one here in the States, it would cost you anywhere on the low end about a thousand to twelve hundred dollars for a, a decent one on the high end, close to four thousand dollars. 
this particular instrument would probably cost close to $3,000 if I bought it in the United States. But again, the cost of a plane ticket was worth it to me because I actually got to play in the steel bands when I was down there and it was just a joy. And um, it, we do read music on the steel pan. Oh, you're welcome. And we do you know, read pitches the same way. In Trinidad, they do it all by rote. It's all taught by ear, as is the djembe. But in our Western tradition, we tend to read music. For example, my steel band was rehearsing right before I came here. We were rehearsing together. I came up to the room here to do this session and I just gave them a new piece of music. And uh, it was funny because we had just got done playing a piece, learning one over the last two rehearsals, and they could play it really, really well. And then, of course, I get them a new piece of music, and they can't play that really well. And they were not liking me when I left the room. I said, see you later, and they were uh, giving me a hard time as I walked out. So. so this is the steel pan. Again, we call it the steel drum in the United States, but the steel pan. So these are you know, among the many instruments I play. Many of the instruments I play as my solo repertoire would be the vibraphone and the marimba. So let's talk about these two, the keyboard percussion instruments. So this is the vibraphone or the vibra harp. It's often associated with jazz. So we have this little fan that goes underneath that gives it this vibrato effect. I'm just using my hand to get that effect right now because I had to move everything around. It's not plugged in where I can make those fans uh, operate with the motor that's built into it. So now the vibraphone, again, it's associated with jazz. You know, Gary Burton, Milt Jackson, Lionel Hampton, the great jazz artists hear things more like this. jazz bands with combos as a soloist. Um, I picked up the, the vibraphone a little later in life uh, compared to some of my other instruments, but again, it shows you some of the other things I get to do with my students. I'll often go through jazz standards, and we'll talk about the way they would be sung and the way we would accomplish them on vibraphone. We talk about improvisation, making up new melodies, composing on the spot. So it's yet another way for my percussionists, my students, to learn yet uh, another aspect of percussion. So finally, I have one other instrument, and then I'm kind of looking at the clock here. So I know we wanted to talk for a while, about 45 minutes playing, and then have some chance for questions. So I think I'm actually, ironically enough, somewhat on schedule, which is pretty rare for me. I usually have to set timers. So I want to do one more thing for you, and that's play the marimba. Now, the marimba is probably the instrument I'm, when people ask me, you know, what are you known for playing? Most people think of me as a marimbist, and I, I appreciate that. It's an instrument I've been playing for a good bit of my life. And this instrument has so much, um, pa I have so much passion for this instrument, just like any of them. I'm going to show you a little bit over here. Beautiful instrument uh, originated in Africa, but then it was developed in Guatemala and Central America. And then it was kind of refined in the North America and turned into this chromatic instrument we associate with our art music. So I do want to play one piece for you in its entirety today. I hope it's a piece you know well. It's a piece called Amazing Grace, and it's a little bit of a work in progress. And I, you know, there's a point where I just like to be honest about music and its passion and power. I'm going to be playing this for the celebration of a friend's life who passed away just last week. And I got a chance to spend time with her, and she asked me to play this piece at her funeral coming up next week. So I was certainly honored to do that. So I have to say it's not um, quite ready for uh, an I should say an audience right now, but I hope you'll bear with me as I play through this because I think it's good for me to share my passion for music and the way it reaches people beyond just in my classroom. Because quite frankly, if I just played music in a room like this, 
that really isn't uh, what music is intended to do. Music is meant to be shared. It's meant to be done in community. It's meant to be done for people and with people. So hope you enjoy this. Now you've uh, got a little snapshot into my life. You've seen what I do as a percussionist, what my students do, what I get to do every day, as long as they let me, I guess. And um, kind of want to close this portion with just a just a, a thank you for letting me do this. I sometimes um, get frustrated with this era we're living in, and there are times where um, it can be you know, when you're not getting to share music the way you would like to. It can feel like you're beating your head against a wall. But then I have moments like this where we break down the barriers and just realize, you know what, we're going to make music not just in spite of what's going on, but because of what's going on, we're going to find new ways to do it and make it different ways to connect with one another. So that's my spiel about percussion. And again, I often tell my students to remember it's um, what you hit, how you hit it, and what you hit it with. And uh, that's kind of that breaks down what I do with my life sometimes. So I've been hitting a lot of things today. I've been hitting with a lot of different things and uh, hopefully doing it pretty well for you. So thank you. And now what I'd like to do is um, I finished, wow, a minute early. My wife is going to be so impressed. She said, you're never going to finish in 45 minutes. You're not going to do it. So um, I want to give us a chance to just chat a little bit uh, with questions. And Julie, I don't know if the chat is the best way to do that. Um, you kind of direct me here. These, these are our veteran Oops, participants, so they'll, really. they'll wave at us or yell and... Um, I don't hear you. You don't hear me? No. I'd like to start, if I may, Julianne. Don, yeah. hold on. I don't know if he can hear us. Hey, Barbara, I see you with your hand up. I am trying to figure out why I can't hear okay. anyone. Uh, so I may have to use the chat. You're still hearing me, but I am not hearing you. I'm going to my yeah. audio settings real quick and trying to figure that out. 
and I have discovered my issue, and now I'll be able to hear you. Excellent. Yes. That, right. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, great. Go ahead, um, John. Uh, it's a joy to have you here, Ken. I think everyone can tell why we were so excited when Ken accepted our invitation to come to Florida. Uh, I have a couple of technical questions, if I may. Okay. Back before you were born in the Dark Ages, <laughs> when I learned to play snare drum, yes. they had us hold the sticks in a totally different way. You may mm -hmm. recall, one you held them across the palm rather than like yes. this. Could you talk about that just a tiny bit? You, sure. Uh, in the early days, and the funny thing is I have fun with my students on this. I'm going to change my view or I can see everybody again. All right. Thank you. Is when I first started, I often go to my students when I teach my music education majors about the fact that we used to wear a drum on a sling. It used to be angled like this. So instead right. of having our elbow up in the air, it would have their hand turned under what's called traditional grip. And the funny thing I always do with this with my students to embarrass them, and they say, oh, that took place so many years ago, so long ago. And I say, well, my freshman year in high school actually carried a sling, so it's not that long ago, but I guess that has been now 30, 40, maybe it has been that long ago, I don't know. But yes, uh, back in the old days, we would wear it on a sling, and we would be marching down, we had our hands turned like this, and nowadays we have these fancy harnesses that keep it flat. So I don't teach traditional grip as much with my percussionists as I used to, but if you've been watching the Gator Band, they still play traditional grip. A lot of times in the marching arts on drum set, I play traditional grip. A lot of times when I play jazz, it's a real common way. So excellent question, Don. Okay. The other question I have is related to the timpani or cattle drum. Okay. Uh, could you tell us about how they're tuned and what they're traditionally tuned to in an orchestral band piece, for example? I'm sorry, would you say that last part? I, I lost it. Oh, I say, how, how you tune a kettle drum or timpani. Sure. And uh, at what pitches they're traditionally tuned to in a band or orchestra. Okay, excellent. Yeah, the kettle drums use a pedal at the bottom of them, the timpani, and that pedal moves and tunes the pitches. I can do any chromatic pitch I want over my four drums. I can usually have a couple of octaves available for that. And then um, as far as traditionally what they're tuned for, the early orchestras tended to tune them to C and G and D and A. So that was probably the most common tuning. When I was playing Handel's Messiah a little while ago, it was D and A with the pitches. Nowadays, though, every pitch is fair game. If you uh, follow music into the modern era, Stravinsky, Bartok, Hindemith, or even the most recent composers, they treat the timpani very chromatically. We have a very fine composer on our faculty, James Oliverio, who has written several timpani concerti uh, both of which I've gotten to play. One of them is called the Olympian, which is a solo uh, concerto for timpani with one player on eight drums. And the other is uh, the Double Dynasty concerto, which I got a chance to perform last year, or maybe it's two years ago now, it seems like time stands still, with two timpanists playing five drums each, and I played that with the University Wind Symphony. And again, we were playing timpani the same way you would play any instrument, chromatically moving our feet like crazy. It almost becomes a dance. Thank you. You bet. I see some questions. Okay, Costa Steel Pan. Um, hopefully, the, hopefully the mic is back on. I know somebody commented about the microphone Julie I did, but I, hopefully it's back to where it needs to be. You guys can hear yes. me okay, right? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, I pulled the plug when I turned it around. I started to wind it around the stand I was on. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, how do I audition students for my program? That's actually a very great question because uh, the way we're auditioning them this year is very different than in previous years. This year, we did everything through virtual auditions. They had to submit videos, and I had Zoom meetings with each student where they had a chance to uh, speak to me. Hopefully, the sound came through pretty well to you as I was performing, but most people don't have fast enough internet or good enough microphones to really handle percussion, so we had them record everything, and then I spoke to them. Typically, we bring people onto campus, and we have them perform for us live. And that would have taken place this past weekend. I sometimes feel a little bit like a football coach, because I recruit students. I go out there and try to find them, just like a coach would try to find a great quarterback. I try to find great percussionists. I had students auditioning from, let's see the states they were from. They were from this year, besides Florida. We had one from North Carolina, one from Ohio, and one from Texas. So that's not that uncommon. Certainly the School of Music reaches internationally, especially in the piano area. We have students from China, Korea, everywhere you can imagine. So I recruit these students, I have them come and audition, like they would try out for a team, and then we offer scholarships. And we take our top four or five, or 
as my boss was telling me this morning, he says, you're taking too many people, but I can't turn people away. So I just keep bringing on more and more percussionists and it, it is a problem I have. So I guess it's a good problem to have. But that's how we bring them into the program. Okay, so Keith, I see you have a question. Could you ask away, please? Yes. Uh, can you hear me all right? I can, yes, thank you. Uh, the first question, sorry, I'm getting feedback from my phone. The first question, uh, sorry. The first question is, uh, that it's got to do with the timpani tuning. I, having played timpani for a little bit in a symphony, um, the problem for I always had was trying, when I knew at, I needed to change the pitches on the timpani, but we weren't there yet, trying to listen to the timpani in a different key than we have been played, it was always very difficult for me. So I'm wondering, guitars now have a little, very simple electronic little instrument they stick on the, guitar and can tune it exactly. Is there such a thing for timpanis now? There is, but unfortunately... Sorry, now I can't hear you. Oh, I'll wait for a sec. Let me know. Give me a thumbs up when you can hear me again, Keith, because I want to try and answer your question. All right. So uh, with timpani, they do have digital electronic tuners, but unfortunately, because of the way the timpani resonate, they pick up other instruments as well. So that when the entire <laughs> orchestra is playing, <laughs> There's no way to use these things. It doesn't plug into a guitar. I'm actually a, a, a bad guitarist, meaning aren't we all bad guitarists who play guitar except for real guitarists? So um, we have to develop the ear. And Keith, you mentioned a very good thing with my students is I have to develop them in their oral skills. There's, all, there's this reputation that percussionists don't have good ears. And that's quite frankly, the worst thing you can do is put somebody with a bad ear on timpani. I often say that we have to have just as good ears as the violin player, just as good ears as the trombone player, because we have to be able to hear every pitch. So to answer your question, Keith, it is a learned skill to be able to get pitch centered in my head that I'm not hearing. So the entire orchestra may be playing in the key of D, but I, my ear has to be in the key of C. And that means I don't have a C sharp anymore. I have a C natural. And it was I, always very difficult. It was. And uh, I wish I had an easy answer to you other than it is something that I work on with singing all the time with my students. I had one this morning and I made them sing pitches and tune. And I tried to mess them up on purpose by playing other pitches and having them tune. And it is almost like an athlete learning. And again, not anybody out there who's a golfer can relate to this. Sometimes you put the ball when you're practicing in the worst possible place in the bunker so you can learn how to hit it out of the bunker because you might end up there <laughs> during your round of golf. So many times for my students in this environment, I put them in the most difficult situation I possibly can so that way, when they're in the orchestra and they have to tune that one note, they can do it successfully. Second question uh, is that the, um, the electronic instrument you showed it initially, uh, my back giving out with my, my many years playing drums probably and dragging lots of drum sets around. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is leaving me, and I'm still playing with uh, several groups, but uh, having more and more trouble dragging those things around. And so I've looked at the possibility of electronic uh, drum sets or, you know, electronic, what did you call them, electrophones? Or yeah, something? electrophones, yeah, MIDI yeah. instruments, yes. Um, and the, uh, uh, the problem has always been, from what I understand, is trying to get a decent cymbal sound out of something electric. And I, I wonder if that's any better now. It is better. It is not <laughs> great. I, I have, uh, on the other end, I don't know if it'll be able to come up across in the picture. I won't be able to there. But I do have a, a very upper end midi kit that I keep here for that very reason because we sometimes need to have things where we just have headphones for practice. So you can see it does have a cymbal pad. It is a rubber pad, but it is at least closer to the cymbal sound than what was out there about 10 years ago and really about five years ago. So it is better. The problem is when we're trying to make this quiet, the material has to be rubberized. Otherwise it defeats the purpose if you're hitting a piece of plastic, which would actually probably feel and sound a little bit more like a cymbal. And the other problem with using an electronic, a digital drum set on the gig is I have to carry all my speakers with me or plug into the sound system. So there is that issue. So I do find that um, what I've done, and uh, I completely relate to you about dragging my drums around. I used to bring around like six drums, you know, 
three or four toms and eight or nine cymbals and all this stuff. And I basically bring my bass drum, my snare drum, one tom, one cymbal, and a hi-hat. So the older I get, the less stuff I feel like carrying around everywhere. But I, I learned pretty quickly from some of my mentors that it's not how many instruments you hit, it's how well you hit them. <laughs> so keep, I can relate yeah. to you um, <laughs> about carrying stuff everywhere. It is a, a, my wife plays the saxophone, she packs her horn up and she leaves. I always give my friends who are flute players a hard time because they pack up and they're gone and I'm still putting my stuff away 20 minutes later. But it is a challenge for percussionists. Let's go to Barbara. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful, enjoyable lecture. I have I was fascinated by the sounds coming out of the steel drum. They were so melodic and so nuanced. And I I don't know whether it was the angle you had from your camera, but I was wondering, is the inside of that molded in any way or is it straight? I mean, how were you producing those gorgeous sounds from that steel drum? Well, thank you very much. Uh, the, part of it is the instrument is just handcrafted wonderfully. I always jokingly say with that instrument, I can play it badly and it still sounds good. So I'm very fortunate that it was made uh, by a, a master craftsman from Trinidad. I'm going to try to do this without pulling my mic plug this time. Let's see if I can do it. Get turned around back to the steel pan. But to answer your question, it is shaped and molded. It's maybe hard to see. I'm going to try to get the camera down in there. We can. It's good. All right. Yeah. But this is not, and this, the funny thing is this one is not my particular instrument. This is one of the schools. This instrument, you can see it has some notes written into it. You can see it has a C and a D and an A. And I do this for my students. I do write the note names on for them because many of them have not played very long and I've been playing this for 30 something years. But it is shaped, each note, if I can explain this well, the whole pan is concave. It's been pounded down, but then each note is bubbled up. So each note is convex, so it bubbles up a little bit. So that note, first of all, gives me a target to aim for, and that's what gives it its characteristic pitch. The other thing is through trial and error, and this is something that's going to be hard to explain, but I'm going to try. In Trinidad, originally, these were uh, containing petrol products. There was a huge refinery in Trinidad, and prior to World War II, there was a lot of oil producing going on there, and still is. But these discarded oil barrels had a lot of these chemicals in there. So they would put them in, the only way they could clean them was by putting them in a fire to burn off the chemicals. <clears throat> it just so happened that somehow through trial and error, the molecular, molecular structure, I don't know if that's correct, you engineer or you scientist can correct me, but the, the properties of the metal change. How about that? I'm just gonna say that. I can say that with confidence. The properties of the metal change. So instead of being a dry sound, the metal starts to sing. And they started huh. to learn <laughs> when certain colors would happen, blue, and gray and things like that, it was time to pull it out. And then that would be when they actually know their pan has been, what you call it, burned. And that's what makes the pan sing. If you take an oil drum and you just beat it down, it's just gonna sound like an oil drum that's been beat down. <laughs> but once you shape it and you put, now of course they put them in large ovens with controlled temperature and timers and things like that, but then the pan starts to sing. Oh, thank you. You bet. Ed, go ahead, Ed Wilkinson. Uh, Professor, I wonder if uh, percussionists suffer with the repetitive motion problems with their wrists or elbows, and if not, what's the secret to avoiding it? All right. Well, I'm going to turn back around so I can sit down so I can rest my back a little bit. How about that? But if you're, you're exactly right. We as percussionists do struggle with carpal tunnel, tendonitis, and things like that. I did have a point in my life where I had to stop playing for about three months to let that rest up because I just was, I was not doing anything wrong, but I was doing it too much. Right. And to avoid that problem, number one, proper technique. That's a big one. Just like athletes, we need to stretch. We need to be in good positions. We need to have good posture. We need to make sure when we're, we're playing over a drum set, we don't have our arms twisted in weird ways. The body is designed to do certain things. And you know, when, when we do, don't do what God designed our bodies to do, our bodies are going to fight against us. Right. So carpal tunnel and tendonitis are probably the most common ones that we have. And recovery from that is just like an athlete. We have to ice it. We have to ta um, do physical therapy. It felt strange as a non-athlete going through physical therapy to, <laughs> to get my, um, limber, my flexibility back. But since that time, I know I'm always going to be concerned about it, but I have to be more careful. So yes, we do struggle with that. And we have to make sure we use proper technique, good stretching and warming down and not overplaying. That's the big one. Thank you. Jan, go ahead. 
I see that you're unmuted, but we can't hear you, Jan. Okay. Where? Oh, maybe I can hear. Hi, Go Jan. Ahead. Jan? There you are. Oh. Jan, we'll come back to you. Yeah, she did. Uh, Michael Plow had a question. Oh, now go ahead, Jan. Okay, Michael Plow, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay, Jan, go ahead. <laughs> All right, sorry. Uh, when I put it on a micro on a little speaker, then the microphone doesn't work. Uh, I'm curious about the music. Um, is it written in treble or bass clef? And uh, is the notation, do they tell you to play in whole notes or quarter notes? Or do you kind of make it up? All right. Now, a lot of it depends on the situation. When I play on the hand drum, the djembe, it's all done by ear. It's all done by a master drummer teaching me. For snare drum, you know, to kind of answer your question, actually, at the music where I can reach it, I'm going to hold it up close. It's actually not written in treble or bass clef. It's written in something called neutral clef or the percussion clef. Huh. So it's a, its own clef. And that way we know that the notes written have no definite pitch. They only have relative pitch to one another. So many times for our non-pitch percussionists, we read just a, a rhythmic chart. Now for pitch music, like when I played Amazing Grace, that is written the same way as the piano music is written. It's written on the grand staff with a bass clef and a treble clef. So I just don't have 10 fingers. I only have four mallets, but it's written the same way. And then timpani is written in bass clef. Vibraphone is usually written in treble clef. So yes, we read quarter notes, eighth notes, 16th notes, and a lot of our repertoire, but sometimes we read just sketches of music. On drum set, I usually see what's called a lead sheet. It gives me an idea of what I do, kind of like a map, and then I have to fill in the gaps. So it's a mixture of things. Thank you. You bet. Michael Plow, go ahead. Thank you. You talked about the importance of having a good ear, especially with timpani. I was wondering how you would explain the ability of a deaf percussionist like Evelyn Glennie. All right. Well, Evelyn. I know she plays with bare feet so she yeah. can feel vibrations in the floor, and that's a big part of her ability. Right. Now, Evelyn, now, first of all, I, I love Evelyn Glennie. So uh, she is amazing. Uh, if you don't know her, her story as a young person, you know, losing just being profoundly deaf it's amazing that she can do what she does it makes me actually feel kind of bad about myself that she can do so well and and i hear just fine and i can't but she is profoundly deaf she hears differently than we do she does hear noise but not pitches the same way for example i i've been on an elevator with evelyn glennie and if you were talking loudly she can hear what you're saying but she hears more through vibration than she does through her ears so she hears in a very different way as you mentioned she plays barefoot and whenever she's working with students, she always has an, a hand on the instrument. For example, when she was working with my students a number of years ago, she'd have her hand touching the instrument so she could feel the vibrations. And that she has gotten used to knowing what an A feels like, what a C feels like. It's quite amazing. And um, her hearing, even though it's done in a different way, is not just as good as mine, it's actually better. She can hear a C or a D through her way of hearing and her hearing is superior, quite frankly. It's quite astounding. So just to make me feel worse about myself, thank you, Michael, for making me feel worse about myself there. But yes, she manages to do it as a completely different way. And once again, we find that uh, when, when there is a will and there is skill, there's going to be a way to make it happen. And she's got that. So th if you don't know Evelyn Glennie, please look her up on YouTube. Uh, amazing. One of my students is playing a piece of hers right now, a chorale she wrote when she was like 12 years old. That even makes me feel worse. She was deaf and she was writing music at 12 years old. So, but yeah, look her up for sure. Richard Petway, go ahead. Um, I have a quite, quite a bit different question. Um, uh, I'm a fan of the Eagles. All right. And the Eagles, the uh, head man of the Eagles that does most of the writing and the singing plays the drum. And I was wondering if uh, I have, not seen others uh, that choose the drum as their main instrument. Usually it's uh, some guitar product, but uh, I'm, I'm just curious about, uh, is he uh, unique in that or do, am I just not exposed to people who choose to lead uh, 
with the drum other than the Eagles. Now, there are not that many, you know, another one that comes to mind is Phil Collins, uh, was the band leader at Genesis, and he would play the drums and sing. But it is, it is uncommon because typically the drummer has a role in not just keeping time, but actually directing the group in, in different places, playing transitional fills, playing way, basically kind of giving yield signs, stop signs, and go signs to the band. So trying to sing and do that at the same time is pretty rare, especially singing lead vocal. So it is not that common. I know the little bit of singing and playing I've done as a drummer, it is a challenge. I can do some, um, some backing vocals, but in the old days, I used to play in a cover band and we would do Jimmy Buffett and I would try to sing and play at the same time. And I never, no matter how good I can sing, and I'm really not that great a singer, once I start doing things rhythmically, it's hard for me to sing things that aren't what I'm playing. So it is rare that you do see a drummer leading a band singing. Thank you. You bet. Other questions? Anyone? Hands? David Polliger. By the way, Dr. Polliger was a percussionist at one time before he became a physician and then found his way to the euphorium. So that's the background. All right. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting and musical. Uh, <clears throat> question is, frequently you see in a rock band sometimes Broadway show band and other venues, the percussionist is not in a cage, but he's screened in somehow. Why? <laughs> well, there, there, um, there's a satire website that talks about free range and uh, cage-free percussionists and things like that. So it's an old joke for us that we feel caged in, but we're often encased in this plexiglass. And that plexiglass is to make sure two things happen. Number one, that our sound can be controlled to the people around us. So if I play really loudly, the person sitting next to me between the plexiglass and I won't be affected by it quite so much. And especially in the recording industry, and I have to use this at my church when we deal with the drums, is that if a singer is singing into a mic and there's a drummer behind him or her, then that microphone he or she is singing into, the drums are picked up by that mic. So that plexiglass helps that sound not get to that microphone. So it's somewhat to control the volume and very much to control when you're miking or recording groups. Thank you. You bet. Yeah, I hate being in the plexiglass bubble. I always feel kind of closed in. So. <laughs> Any and other I, questions? Well, I do see Julie. Yeah, if you want, want to share that YouTube clip of Evelyn Glennie, I don't know how long the particular clip is you are looking at, but if people want to get a little glimpse of her, that would be great. I, I just pulled one up real quick while we were talking. So let me okay. share this real quick. We have time, so we're in good shape. Okay. how I physically feel sound. Now, obviously, it's quite a different experience when you're practically on top of the instruments, when you're the producer of the sound, as opposed to being the, the listener or a member of the audience. But nevertheless, we can all physically feel sound. We just have to pay attention. And the idea is opening up your body like a resonating chamber. So when I strike this big bass drum, you can actually see the head vibrate. I can see it very clearly, even just by looking at it face on, but from the side, you can really, really see that. But if I put my fingernail on the drum, So that's a long time that it's actually resonating through my fingernail or wherever you put your hand. And the idea is to really pay attention. And that's really what listening is all about. But also, if I take a stick, and very often when I hold a stick or a mallet, I almost just have my little pinky supporting the stick so that when I actually strike something, I'm allowing the vibration of the, the, the sound to come through the shaft of the mallet. So for example, if I go closer to the edge, the vibration is much closer together. I just thought I'd show that. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? 
What any, other, oh. any final questions here, anyone? Then I'd like to close with one, Ken. Okay. Uh, a lot of the major repertoire for percussion ensemble, as you know, includes piano. So do you do you consider the piano to be a percussion instrument? Uh, Put you on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's a. Uh, I, I do and I don't. I think the piano holds a unique, uh, just a unique voice. That it is percussion, but it is also its own unique voice. So I'm gonna straddle the fence carefully here to make sure I don't offend anyone, but um, I freely admit I'm not a pianist. I can play chords, I can get around on it, but I do think that it is, the answer is yes and no. How about that? I think, I think you handled that beautifully. Okay, thank you. Hopefully nobody will be mad at me for that one. <laughs> Well, I think this has been a fantastic presentation, a glorious end to the whole series, and I'd ask all of the ones in the class to join me in thanking Ken. Thank you too, John. Yes. Great series.